Okay, so I'll just tell you. So I'm Bonnie Mitchell from the Jackson County Historical Society, and we're so glad to see everybody here. We are also doing this in conjunction with the Friends of the Caves and the Friends of Jackson County Conservation. So we have some new faces here, but we would just like to know if there are people here not from Jackson County, if you would just let us know how many people are here. Well, thank you very much. We're really glad that you we're really glad that you came. Thank you. Um, I just have one little announcement that I would like to make because it's kind of time effective. There's a, a box right outside the door and uh, a little yellow sign. And it's a project that Marcella Henneke is working on. But we heard from a young third grader from the state of Virginia by the name of Grayson. And their school is studying the United States. And he chose to do Iowa. So he is going to represent our state. And he's asking us. He, he's looked up things on the internet. He's done all his research. But he feels that you can learn more by talking to the people and getting the people's idea. So he wants to hear from us what we love about Iowa and what important things about Iowa we would like to give him. So you can put things in our box. It'll be there for the next maybe three or four weeks. You can put things in pictures, postcards, pamphlets, anything that you want him to have that he can use to tell about our great state. And he said that he's going to make a huge exhibit to take the, to the Virginia State Fair and that he plans to do our state proud, that we will be proud of him because we all... So when everything's gathered together, Marcel Henneke is going to wrap it all up and mail it off to his school in Virginia. A third grader named Jason. Grayson. Grayson. Anyway, I thought that was, that was pretty special. And so hopefully we can all come up with something so he has a wide variety of things to choose from. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce Jess Wagner, who most of you know from the Hurstville Interpretive Center from Jackson County Conservation, who will introduce our guest. So, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so like Bonnie said, I'm Jessica Wagner with Jackson County Conservation, and with the Friends of Makokota Caves, and the Jackson County Historical Society. Uh, we applied for a grant through Humanities Iowa for our speaker today. Uh, so we're really excited to introduce Tom Milligan. Uh, Tom has spent 45 years as a working theater artist here in Iowa. Uh, an actor, a director, a scenic designer, as well as a producer. His work has been seen throughout Iowa and the Midwest. His 16-year association with Humanities Iowa reflects his passion for both theater and history through his unique one-man play presentations. Tom Milligan has actually made a couple trips to Makokota uh, in the past for his pro programs on J. Ding Darling. Uh, we held that at the Hurstville Interpretive Center years ago, and also his presentation on Grant Wood, uh, which was here for Brown Bag Lunch several years ago, I'm not sure when. Who, who attended that? I'm kind of curious. Who attended that, the Grant Wood? Uh, or remembers attending. There we go. <laughs> uh, well, we're excited to have you all here, and we're excited to welcome Tom back um, again for his one-act play, American Dreamer, The Life and Times of Henry A. Wallace. This program is funded by Humanities Iowa. Humanities <laughs> Iowa is a private nonprofit and also the State Historical Society. A cultural resource for Iowans since 1971, Humanities Iowa brings humanities programs into the heart of Iowa communities. The humanities are fields of study that help us to discover and remember who we are and how we came to be, as individuals and as part of the world. Humanities Iowa offers funding for the Speaker Bureau event and for grants in support of public programs to nonprofit organizations in the state of Iowa. Uh, if you have not already, uh, we tried to catch everybody at the door, but we do need you to sign in uh, following the event if you didn't sign in before. Uh, your name is sufficient. If you want to put in your address or your city state, that's fine, but just need a name um, so we can report back to Humanities Iowa uh, the great attendance we have here today. So, um, and that kind of brings me to my introduction here. So I would like us all to, uh, to join me in welcoming Tom Milligan. Welcome, everyone. So good to see you all. Thank you for coming out and visiting with us today. 
You know, Ilo and I, we don't get very many visitors out here to Farview anymore, so it's nice to see you all show up today. I hope you had a great lunch. You know, I did have a reporter call me the other day. He said he wanted to ask me a few questions. I suppose he was writing one of those, where are they now, kind of articles. Well, that's what most of the reporters who find their way out here are after. Well, I'll tell you the exact same thing I told him. Henry A. Wallace is right where he's always been, in his garden. A garden at the beginning of things, a garden in Washington, D.C. More I saw of Washington, better I thought of strawberries. I was once asked what the key was to successful gardening, and I know the audience was expecting a dissertation in genetics. I answered, sympathy for the plants. <laughs> I thought I'd garden forever. Well, I can still run a half mile. I can still do 22 push-ups. I still play a fair game of tennis. I expected to be around for my 100th birthday, but I've been diagnosed with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. Oh, it's a fascinating thing, really. I'll have a ringside seat to watch my own body disintegrate. I'm going to let the doctors do whatever they want to on me. I'm going to keep a diary, reflections of an ALSer. Yes, I'm going to fight this battle, this last battle with everything that I've got. Science, curiosity, endurance, and faith. I will regret not being able to get out into the fields. Of course, ALS will only stop me physically. I'll still be able to give my plants all the psychic input that I can manage. <laughs> Well, I am a mystic. <laughs> At least that's what some folks called me. President Roosevelt called me old man common sense. Others called me Mr. Editor, Mr. Secretary of Commerce, Mr. Vice President. A Republican, a Democrat, a progressive, bitter, eccentric, ambitious, self-righteous, self-important, self-intoxicating, strange, a red, a fool, a dupe, and a few other things I can't mention here. <laughs> Those uh, money bosses, Washington, the, the power bosses, the, they, they, they never could quite get a handle on me, never could quite figure me out, figure out a way to get to me. And when people can't figure out a way to get to you, they become annoyed. Well, I was annoying. In fact, I was probably most annoyed when people realized that I didn't care what they thought of me. Well, now that's, that's not true. There was a time. <clears throat> that, that bitter time of lies and hatred, that time when to be for peace was wrong and to be for war was right. There was a time I wanted people to know exactly who I was then and who I was not. I am not a wild-eyed firebrand. I'm, I'm the quiet son of Iowa soil. I'm not anti-American. I'm not un-American. I am not a communist. I'm a progressive capitalist who believes in God. Look at these strawberries. They give the heart hope. I started raising strawberries when I was a boy. I assigned a portion of my garden to my brothers. They refused. They said, why should we have to take care of the strawberries just because you like them? Well, that's an honest question. When and why should anyone have to take up another's beliefs? Well, I'll tell you when those beliefs are right. I never doubted myself when I was right. I was right most of the time. <laughs> I am a Wallace after all. Perhaps you've heard of my grandfather, Henry Wallace, no middle initial. The world called him Uncle Henry. He was the editor of the world's most important farm journal, Wallace's Farmer, apostrophe after the S. You know, when I was a boy, I didn't have to wonder what God was like as most children do, I knew. He was like my grandfather, not the other way around. What is the chief end of man? That's what my grandfather used to ask me as we sat together on his fine front porch. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You know, my grandfather could have been Secretary of Agriculture, but he declined. He said, no Wallace had ever held an office higher than Justice of the Peace, and I don't want to mar the family record. <coughs> my grandfather was a very wise man. Now, my father, Henry C. Wallace, he was Secretary of Agriculture under President Harding and then President Coolidge. 
When he went off to Washington, he said, I will do the best I know. Well, he did better than that. 1920s were hard years in the farm belt, dark years, but my father, he fought hard for farm relief. The time and time again, he was frustrated by a Republican Congress and presidential vetoes, but even with the odds stacked against him, he battled on. 1926, Henry C. Wallace worked himself to death fighting for the Iowa farmer. After his funeral, I went back to my office at Wallace's farmer and I wrote these words. His battle for rural equality will go on. So will his fight for higher standards of living and better working conditions for the Iowa farmer. I wrote that Henry C. Wallace died with his armor on in a fight for a cause with which he loved and I pledged to continue that fight. And by the summer of 1932, there was much fighting to be done. By the summer of 1932, the, the average farm income had dropped by more than two thirds. But by the summer of 1932, six out of every 10 Iowa farms were mortgaged to survive and many did not. By the summer of 1932, corn was so worthless that folks were burning it for heat rather than lugging it to market. By the summer of 1932, misery had moved into this heartland like an unwanted relative who just would not leave. Those, uh, those quiet folks that worked their land, worshiped their gods, served their country, they, they were desperate. Every day I would receive letters. What is there to do? What can I do? Why isn't Washington doing something? That there should be such want in a land of such plenty. And so it was. And so it was that on August 12, 1932, this registered Republican, this son of a Republican cabinet officer, this grandson of a Republican, was invited out to Hyde Park, New York to have lunch with the Democratic presidential candidate. Now, I fully expected to find Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a typical Easterner without much knowledge of the middle of this country and even less interest. I knew his legs were paralyzed. I knew he came from wealth. I expected a man find a man pretty well worn out. But what I found was a man fresh and eager, ready to pitch into the farm problem at once. I found a man who knew that he didn't know all of the answers and was willing to find out anything he could from those who did know. I found a man of ideas, and ideas had always been very close to my heart. I came back to Iowa and started campaigning. With Roosevelt, the farmers have a chance. With Hoover, they have none. <laughs> that November, Franklin Roosevelt won about everything in the states in all the agriculture states as well. I was actually walking through Waterworks Park in Des Moines, Iowa when I received my summons from the president by way of a Western Union bicycle messenger. He handed me the telegram. Franklin Roosevelt was asking me to become his secretary of agriculture. I wrote back, Mr. President, there's only one reply that I can give you. I appreciate the honor and accept the responsibility. Well, there was nothing else that I could do. God, duty, agriculture, that had been my inheritance from the hour of my birth. From that moment on, I was a Wallace and a gentleman. That would be my glory and my burden. I was actually born on a 300 acre farm 10 miles from the county seat in Greenfield, Iowa. Well, that's who Henry A. Wallace is. Before anything else, I'm a farmer's son. 1887, my father, he sold two pigs and bought a Surrey to take his wife to their new home. I came along about a year later. Well, not by Surrey. <laughs> my, uh, my father, he was a smart farmer. He was an intelligent farmer. But he was an unlucky farmer. 1888, 1889, the year after I was born, corn was selling for about uh, oh, 30 cents a bushel. I didn't know any of that. My days were filled with prairie flowers and the sight of storm clouds rolling up dark against the summer sky. I could still feel the snap of the wind against my face on a bobsled ride to town. My mother, May Broadhead, she was a strict Methodist. She disapproved of tobacco, drank neither coffee nor alcohol. 
She thought salads were a newfangled notion being foistered upon America by women's clubs. <laughs> I was every inch of Wallace, but I was also the son of Mae Broadhead. I always preferred milk. <laughs> it was my mother that taught me how to read, how to plant seeds and worship God. Well, even today I don't do one without thinking of the other. Well, after five years on the farm, my folks, they had two healthy children and not much else, so we decided that uh, my father moved us up to Ames, Iowa, where we lived in this chilly little shack down by the railroad. My father, he enrolled at Iowa State College. He finished two years in one and then went on to become a professor on the faculty there. You know, those days in Ames, my best friend was a man by the name of George Washington Carver. He was... He was six feet tall, I was six years old. <laughs> Together we went on these, uh, these botanizing expeditions, that's what he called them. Do you, do you know about George Washington Carver? He was the son of slaves before he became a world famous chemist. He, he traveled all over the United States after, years after the Civil War before finally settling in Ames, Iowa. He became Iowa State's first black student. I didn't know many other kids, but I did know about plants. The boy who loved plants. That's what Carver called me. And as we wandered the fields together, we talked. George Washington Carver taught me that man must seek to understand all living things with as much fervor as he sought to understand steel and cement and gas and oil that God can speak to you from the parts of a flower or a blade of grass. You know, maybe I am a mystic. Same way that George Washington Carver was a mystic. He believed, he taught me to believe, that God is present in all places and in all things. That God is present in all people. Well, as I was wandering the fields with Carver, one controversy or another forced my father off of the faculty at Iowa State and ousted my grandfather as the editor of the Iowa Homestead Magazine. Both Henry C. and Uncle Henry without a job. Seems like the future had hit rock bottom. It seemed about as bleak as Iowa in the middle of February. But all that was about to change. The Wallaces, they came to their own rescue. They always did. Now, Henry C. knew that Uncle Henry would likely just shrivel up and die if he didn't have some sort of platform to stand on, so that's exactly what he gave his father. The project he took on, the platform he took up, was a farm journal called Wallace's Farmer. <laughs> yeah, doesn't seem a very hopeful project, Henry C. wrote to a friend upon launching Wallace's Farmer, but on father's account, it's the only thing to do. <laughs> well, things went a little better than expected. Right from the beginning, it was a family operation. My, my father was the publisher. My grandfather was the editor. My uncles, they sold the advertising. My grandmother, she wrote the Heart and Homes page. Good farming, clear thinking, right living. That was its credo. It ran on the line right below the paper's title. In, in six words, it summed up what that newspaper stood for. It also summed up what the Wallaces stood for. In 18, 1892, the whole Wallace Farmer operation moved to Des Moines. I was only about 10 years old. I, I'd never been to school before. I, I didn't know many kids, but, but I was not lonely. No, no, no. You can never be lonely in a house full of brothers and sisters and a player piano. <laughs> we had an acreage in Des Moines. I was glad of that. Now, I was the oldest son, so I had chores to do. Let's see what I do. Well, I, well, I, had to, uh, I had to shovel coal into the furnace, uh, pump water into the tanks. I took care of the sow and her pigs and, 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 my, and my, my uncle's horse from next door. My mother was always after me to change my clothes after I did my chores. She said she didn't want me to go to school smelling like a country boy. <laughs> Usually I forgot. <laughs> or just didn't bother. There always seemed to be something in the country boy in me. There always seemed to be manure on my shoes. Literally or figuratively. <laughs> 1910, I graduated from uh, Iowa State College, finished the uh, top of the school's agricultural division, if you're interested. Uh, 1914, I married Miss Ilo Brown. Well, Ilo was the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. I met her first at a picnic. She said I made her feel, feel secure 
and she made me feel comfortable. Ilo's friends were always after her to do something about Henry, they'd say. Do something about his hair that never seems to be combed, or do something about the ties that never seem to match the suits that never seem to fit. <laughs> well, Ilo, Ilo told her friends that she didn't mind how I went about. She liked my good qualities. That was enough for her. Good for a man to have a woman who feels like that. I wasn't much of a suitor. Now, I courted Isla with numerous trips to the poultry barn and a fair amount of conversation about Chinese agricultural practices. <laughs> At the wedding, the bride was described as regal and the groom as dazed. <laughs> that, that pretty well summed things up. <laughs> You know, my grandparents, they had a big old Victorian home in Sherman Hill, the old Victorian neighborhood in Des Moines, with a big wide porch, big wide steps. And I'd sit out there with my grandfather. And we'd read aloud together. And we'd talk about clover and hogs and God. In solving the problems that will come up from day to day and from time to time, it is truly the man who is on God's side that is on the side of the majority. Although the world may not see it, and he for a while may doubt it, prosperity will appreciate the man who does the right as he sees the right. Now that's not from the Bible. It's the closest thing to it. It was a letter that my grandfather wrote to me when I came of age, turned 21 that is. I was a, I was a senior at Iowa State College. I remembered those words the rest of my life. During the 1948 campaign, I remembered them every day. I was 26 years old, working as the editor at Wallace's Farmer when my grandfather died. Letters of sympathy came in from every important place around the world and every little farm in the town, farm belt. At his funeral, our family, we gathered at his home in Sherman Hill. And then standing around his casket, we drew up the Wallace family covenant. And within that covenant, we promised to keep untarnished the family name. We promised to continue the good work that he had begun. Then one by one we stepped up, we signed the scroll, and then the sons and the grandsons of Henry Wallace put his casket on their shoulders and carried it to his funeral. Religion is not a philosophy, <coughs> but a life. That's what my grandfather wrote in his will. A life which forever tends towards harmony with the Creator. I believe these words to be true. I believe I learned what I learned as a boy sitting on my grandfather's fine front porch. I believe I learned what I learned as a boy walking the fields with George Washington Carver, that man best serves God through service to his fellow man. And the men that my grandfather cared most about were farmers. So I suppose my turn towards corn was a natural one. <laughs> when I was a boy, corn became my passion, maybe my obsession, most certainly my cause, and it would remain so for the next three decades. I hope you have a passion. A passion will help you get through. You know, the thing about corn is that you can study it, you can ponder it, you can tinker with it. Well, it practically begs to be tinkered with. The thing about corn, it was created by God in the glaciers to plump up our four-footed animals, turn them into food, and therefore to feed the world. Now, the Native Americans, they called corn our life. Now, I'm sure you know how it works. We need good corn to give us good seed, to give us good corn, so on, so on, and so on. Well, it was the Incas that started the perpetuation of corn through the process of visual selection. Well, I'm sorry. Well, what I mean is, that, well, the, the farmers, they'd take their best-looking ears, and they'd set that aside, and they'd use that as seed for next year's crops. <laughs> Boy, when I was a boy, corn was king. They used to have these used to have these corn shows all around the country, and the farmers they'd take their best looking ears into the show ring, and the judges would decide which ones were the prettiest and therefore the best. It's kind of like a beauty pageant. 
<laughs> yeah, when I was a boy, corn was king, and reed yellow dent was the king of the corn. It was the prettiest corn in the Midwest. <laughs> yep, corn was king, and its preacher and teacher was Perry G. Holden, the corn professor, the evangelist of corn. Well, he was like a one-man circus traveling all around the country, judging corn shows and preaching to the multitude on how to obtain a long and beautiful life through the beautiful virtues of reed yellow dent. <laughs> There were a few skeptics to this, a few scientists, a handful of old-fashioned dirt farmers, and one shy, serious high school boy named Henry A. Wallace. Not, 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 not that the rest of the Wallaces agreed with me. In fact, it was Wallace's farmer that paid for the corn professor to teach at Iowa State, so I just decided I'd, I'd enroll in one of his classes. For two weeks, I sat and I listened to the corn professor expound his words. His words just didn't seem to make sense to me. I, I had a strong suspicion the corn professor was wrong. So one day, I just, I just raised my hand. Sir, I said, what's looks to a hog? <clears throat> well, pretty well shocked the corn professor. He said, quite a jolt through the classroom as well. One of my friends said, Henry Wallace, you're only 15. What do you know? Well, I am 15, I said, and I'm right. Well, the corn professor said, if you think I'm wrong, then prove it. <laughs> I came home with a bag of 33 ears of reed yellow dent. That spring, I asked my father to give me five acres of land out behind the house. That summer, I walked my 66 rows of corn. That fall, I harvested the crops. I husked the ears and I put them in numbered piles on the floor of my grandfather's garage. That, that winter, I went back out to that garage. I stared, I waited. I just ached to know if what I thought was so. When the corn was dried, I shelled it, I weighed it, I figured the percentage of beer composed of cob. I asked if it made the weight loss through drying. I devised a ratio of whole fresh picked ears to shell dried corn. But, I'm sorry, did I lose you? <laughs> I went back out to that garage. I filled up sheet after sheet of row after row of numbers. Math is a wonderful thing. I took the results to my family. I had proven that the ear that Holden had picked out as the worst was the best in yield. And the one that he had picked out as the prettiest was the worst in yield. I had proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was no correlation between looks and yield. <coughs> so without a sword, but with a sling and a stone and a soft lead pencil, David defeated Goliath. <laughs> I have always said that neither corn nor men were ever meant to be completely uniform. <laughs> well, after my 20 years after my brush up with the professor, not much changed for Iowa farmers. Corn was still pollinated by the breeze, still harvested by hand. Average yield was about 30 bushels an acre, same as it had been when I was born in 1888, but all that was about to change. It all started in May of 1926 with a meeting of nine friends in the basement of the Grant Club in Des Moines, Iowa. We started a company that night, that's what we did. The first company dedicated to the development, the production, and the sale of hybrid corn. It would come to be called Pioneer Hybrid. Our first year, Pioneer made profits of about $30. <laughs> but all that was about to change too. Now, Roswell Garst, we never called him anything but Bob. He hailed from Coon Rapids, and I'll tell you, Bob Garst had a gift for Gap. He could just sell darn near anything to anybody. So one day I gave Bob some high bred corn. I said, go home, try that out. So Bob and a high school pal of his, Charlie Rippy, they planted that high bred corn in two rows of ordinary corn from the Rippy farm. But one summer day, a big gust of wind came by and blew down all the Rippy corn. But the high bred corn stood strong and tall. Like Paul on the road to Damascus, Bob Garst was converted on the spot. <laughs> on the spot, we cut a deal and seal it with a handshake. You know, it wasn't easy trying to sell corn for $5 a bushel in the middle of the Depression, but even in that terrible time, our small band of apostles moved out and across the plains and the prairies, bringing them the, the miracle of high-bred corn. It was a, a revolution as quiet as a cornfield on a windless summer day that we were preaching, but farm by farm by farm by farm by farm, we changed agriculture forever. We fed the world. 
It wasn't le easy to leave Iowa. Just as difficult as it had been for my father 12 years before, but to save Iowa, I had to leave. I hit the ground running when I joined Roosevelt's cabinet as Secretary of Agriculture in 1932. and seemed like I didn't stop for years, and that's just exactly the way I wanted it. When I arrived in Washington, the fog of panic was so thick over the Ag Department building, people were choking on it. Within hours of Roosevelt's inaugural, we'd carved out a plan. Within three weeks, we had crafted that plan into a farm bill, and within three months, that bill had become law. Some people damned it. I didn't care. Others praised it. I didn't care. I only cared about the people who were too weary to give a damn. I rose every morning at 5 o'clock, walked three miles across Rock Creek, parked in my office, and set to work. Washington had never seen anything like Henry A. Wallace in action. <laughs> oh, the press, they had a field day with me. They took pictures of me staring into cornfields. <laughs> they took pictures of me staring at farm animals. They wrote how I, I didn't like to ride in limousines, and my favorite meal was a cheese sandwich and a glass of milk. <laughs> They wrote how I like to uh, spend my evenings doing calculus problems, although I had to finally tell them they were wrong on that. Although I did like to relax by using methods of multiple and partial correlation to determine the net regression lines defining the relationship of one variable to another. I lost the reporters on that one too. <laughs> they wrote how uh, one time I was, uh, I was vice president and I, I came across in a hotel lobby a photographer struggling to carry his equipment. So I walked over, I picked up the camera and I carried it out to the curb for him, set it down. Well, that just shocked folks. The next paper day, the newspapers reprimanded me by saying, well, the vice president of the United States doesn't so much as reach for a telephone directory, let alone fetch and carry for a man without a title. Well, I, I said back, well, you see, I'm from the Midwest. And we think about things a little differently out there. 1936. I campaigned all over for Roosevelt. When he came to Des Moines, I was with him. 200,000 people lined the streets of Des Moines as the motorcade rolled by. You saved our farm! That's what they said as the motorcade rolled by. You, you saved our farm! You know, that's what all that had been for. The meetings held, the hours spent, the time, the money, you saved our farm. That November, Roosevelt won all the farm states and just about everything else. After the 90, 90, 1936 campaign, I took a trip across the back roads of the Mississippi Delta, across the plains of Appalachia. How are the crops? Well, that's what I'd yell at people as they were working out in the fields. How are the crops? <laughs> you know, sometimes I'd knock on houses with big gaping holes in the roof, no windows. How are things with you folks? Do, you, do, you, do your children, do they go to school? Do they get enough fruit, enough oranges, vegetables, milk? It's painfully clear they didn't. Most times, people didn't even know who I was. Well, that was the way I wanted. I wanted to hear the truth. Well, when a reporter would tell them what my name was and my title was, they just wouldn't believe it. They didn't think that an important man from Washington could be sitting in the middle of their kitchen table. I went to their church services on Sunday. I listened to their preaching. I sang their old hymns. How are things with you folks? I came back to Washington ashamed. Subsistent farmers, landless tenants, day laborers, sharecroppers, they make up one half of this nation's agricultural workforce and only receive 12% of our national farm income. We will change that. And we did. We passed the Farm Security Administration dedicating to combating rural poverty. We passed the Soil Conservation Act dedicated to saving the voiceless land, as my grandfather had called it. At that time, in that place, people stopped asking, what is in, in this for me? And instead, they started asking, what is in this for all of us? Those, uh, 
practical men of Washington. The party bosses, the insiders, the money men. They talked about that trip down south. They said, Henry Wallace goes off on tangents. They were right. They said, Henry Wallace is a dreamer. And they were right. In their smoke-filled rooms of Washington, I dreamed of the clean, clear Iowa air and the way the world should be. And when I tried to put those dreams into action on this earth, those practical men of Washington called me a starry-eyed idealist, impractical, unworldly. Walter Lippmann, the preeminent columnist of his day, wrote that I was an, an isolated man to whom the shape of the real world is not clear. Well, let me tell you something, Mr. Lippmann, that a farmer, any farmer, not only knows the shape of the real world, but the sense of it far better than any columnist. Come out to my garden, Mr. Lippmann, and, and pull some weeds, or, or drive with me out in the country and sit at a farm wife's table and talk to her husband about the price of corn, or come down south with me, Mr. Lippmann, and see the ragged children working in the fields living on nothing but cornbread and molasses, and then you tell me who it is that knows the shape of the real world. Nineteen forty. Franklin Roosevelt seeking his uh, third term in the White House, and he's starting to look around for a new running mate, and he's starting to throw my name around. Party bosses all had the same reaction. <laughs> Anyone but Wallace. <laughs> he's not one of us, they said, and, and they were right. He is no it. No oomph, they said, and they were right. I actually think that it was my lack of oomph that appealed to Frank and Roosevelt. The president once said, there's something very genuine about a man who would give the president of the United States seed corn as an Easter gift, <laughs> with specific directions on when, where, and how to use it. Anyone but Wallace, that's what all the party bosses were saying at the 40 convention, anyone but Wallace, but the president prevailed. He always did. And so Wallace was on the ticket. <coughs> Traveled all over the country, met some really nice people. I'll have to admit, it's a pretty, uh, pretty strange way to live. Time Magazine did a cover story on me. They called me the unconventional candidate, and I imagine I was. They called me the Will Rogers of intellectuals. I like that. And so on election day, Roosevelt and Wallace won 44 states, 449 electoral votes. It was a pretty definitive win. But we didn't carry Iowa. And I'll have to admit that rankled. <laughs> President Roosevelt tried to call me down by saying that all of his elections, he'd never carried his own hometown. But it still rankled. And so at a cold January morning, just after noon in 1941, Henry A. Wallace became the 33rd Vice President of the United States. My first official act was to remove the bar out of the office of the Vice President. My second was to remove the urinal. Didn't seem to have a need for the latter without the former. <laughs> I tried to equip myself with as much knowledge and information as I could about the duties and the offices of the Vice President. I soon learned there were none. Uh, the, the vice president, he does provide, preside over the Senate, one of the more futile jobs I've ever known. I presided as little as possible. I, I, I tried to invite the senators into the gym to spar with me, and only one, Evan Ellender from Louisiana, ever got in the ring with me. After I knocked him out, nobody else would get back in there again. I used to go out to the Potomac River Park every morning and throw the boomerang for exercise. In the press, they were always trying to get a story and a photograph. Well, this one poor fellow, he knelt down right in front of me just as I let fly. Well, he didn't think to look around behind me, and just that boomerang came back around and hit him smack in the back of the head. Well, I surely did apologize. But I'll have to admit, it was a pretty nifty way to take out a member of the press. <laughs> I had a victory garden on the grounds of the Swiss Embassy during the war. My sister, she was married to the head of the Swiss legation there, and she arranged for me to, to use the land. I'd go back out there every morning, and I'd put my hands in the soil, and I'd, I'd remember who I was, why I was. President Roosevelt, he appointed me the chairman of the Board of Economic Warfare. 
It was the first time in U.S. history a vice president had been given any serious administrative duties. What Roosevelt needed to win that war, I gave him. 1944, Franklin Roosevelt seeking his fourth term in the White House, everybody knows that. Everybody also knows that he's an ill man. Whoever receives the vice presidential nomination would most certainly ascend to the White House. Now who would that be? <laughs> Anyone but Wallace. <laughs> I knew the party bosses found me too controversial. I, I, I knew that they were trying to shove me off of the ticket, but I, I wasn't worried. Besides, I had President Roosevelt's word that he was behind me. And on August 10th, I asked the president, if you were a delegate, would you vote for Wallace for vice president? He said, yes, of course. July 12th, I said, am, am, am I being shoved off of this ticket? And he, he looked at me, and he took my hand, and pulled me down next to where he was sitting, and smiled and said, I hope it will be the same old team. And I believed him. July 20th, I stood stiff-necked in front of the National Democratic Convention. I knew I was staring straight into the face of the enemy, but there was a few things I wanted them to hear. The future belongs to those who go down the line for democracy, regardless of race, sex, or religion. The poll tax must go. Equal educational opportunities must come. With a prayer for prompt victory in this war, permanent peace, and full employment, I second the nomination of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The uh, demonstration for the president went just as the party bosses had planned. And then suddenly something unexpected happened. Unscripted, unplanned, the convention suddenly erupted for me. Now back up at the podium, Samuel Jackson, the convention chairman, he banged his gavel, order, I will have order. But the, the plain people, the people in the galleries, they would not be still. Now Robert Hannigan, the chairman of the National Democratic Committee, he was standing next to Jackson. He, the convention was bolting out of his control. Now, according to him, the vice presidential nomination was supposed to be made the next evening. But the crowd, they wanted a reaction right there. They wanted Wallace. Now, Senator Claude Pepper of Florida knew that if he could get my name in front of the convention that night, that moment, with them yelling my name, with their voices ringing off the rafter with my name, I'd win the nomination by popular acclaim. Claude knew it. Hannigan and Jackson knew it. Everybody in the crowd knew it. Claude started his way for the podium. He elbowed aside the money bosses, the, the, the party bosses, the insiders, the money men of Washington. Now at the base of the steps leading to the podium there was a gate and it was guarded by a union man, a Wallace man. And even though the party boss suggested frantically not to let Claude by, that's exactly what the guard did. Claude Pepper was one step away from the podium. One step away from placing Henry A. Wallace of Iowa back in the ticket and if he had one, Henry Wallace was just one weary heartbeat away from the White House. You know, at that moment, at that time, there was only one man who could stop me. There was only one man the party bosses, the insiders, the money men would listen to, and that one man had already told Robert Hannigan exactly what he wanted. You're taking your orders from me, Hannigan screamed at Jackson, and I'm taking my orders from the President of the United States. And with that, Jackson banged his gavel, I call for a vote of adjournment. And the crowd, they roared back, no, no, no. The eyes have it, the eyes have it, the eyes have it. And with that, Jackson commanded the power to be shut off to the organ. The lights were dimmed, the session was over, and that... was that. What could have been, all that could have been, was not to be. Throughout the night, cold cash changed hands, favors were exchanged. The next day, Wallace of Iowa was off of the ticket and Truman of Missouri was on. <coughs> 
I tried to take it well. I am a Wallace after all. <coughs> <coughs> the last time I saw President Roosevelt was uh, after the inaugural, April, the dinner party at the White House. He had just appointed me Secretary of Commerce. He looked tired, but in high spirits. Later on that night, I would have a dream, the same dream that I would have again and again in the days to come. But in that dream, the president and I are walking together in a field. And he's without his wheelchair, using neither his leg braces nor his crutches. We're walking together freely in the remembered fields of my childhood. Three weeks later, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was dead. My uh, political career came to a crashing halt with the presidential candidate in 1948. I ran for president on the Progressive Party ticket. Now, the Progressive Party is the party of the people, the union worker, the homemaker. The Progressive Party will be funded by people, not corporations. As a candidate of the Progressive Party, I refuse to speak in segregated halls, sleep in segregated hotels, or eat in segregated restaurants. My, my running mate, Glenn Taylor, was thrown into a jail in Alabama for going into an entrance marked Coloreds Only. But still, we proceeded. They had to know what we believed in. On election night, we didn't receive a single electoral vote. After the 48 campaign, I, I, I came back up here to Farview. I, I needed to work with my hands again. I needed to plant something. Tomatoes, strawberries for sure. I needed to come out here every day and see that things would have an order in them and things would be green again. And, and knowing just that, I'd be able to go on. I needed to remember the secret. Take up gardening. You have to go on to see what comes up next year. <laughs> I've got quite a, quite a little experimental farm here. I've got a wonderful research library. Uh, I've, I'm, on, I'm on the quest of, got 15,000 chickens. I'm on the quest to breed the perfect chicken to lay the perfect egg. <laughs> Ilo says the chickens are starting to overrun my life. But that's not true. I've got my, my tomatoes, strawberries, eye-popping gladiola. Chinese cabbage, ultra-rich in vitamin C, you know. And I travel some. I, I go to Europe, Latin America. I help the scientists improve their agriculture production there. And I started research facilities. Mexico, Guatemala, Cuba, Latin America. <clears throat> I, I still like to disappear into my own fields every once in a while. Whosoever shall make two blades of grass or two ears of corn grow on a spot where only one has grown before, will deserve better of mankind and do more essential service to his country than a whole race of politicians put together. I didn't write that. Some Gulliver's Travels. <laughs> but I believe it to be true. The enhancement of the quality of soil leads directly to the enhancement of the quality of life. The highest aspiration a human can have is to increase the quality of life for mankind. And that's just what scientific knowledge, scientific research does for all of us. It improves the quality of life for mankind. Corn breeding, germplasm, disease resistant nutrition. I am interested in all of it still. I am still a man at play in the fields of the Lord. Say, um, if you have a minute, there is just one last story I'd like to tell you. you know, this, may, this may be my last chance to get things down, get things straight. <laughs> well, it was uh, just after the inaugural. I'd just been appointed Secretary of Commerce, and 
the president, he invited me to uh, dinner at the White House, lunch. We, we sat on the lawn under the shade of a big old magnolia tree, and we talked about Chicago and the convention. And he told me about how at his first convention, 1932, he didn't have enough electoral votes to win the nomination. About how he made a deal with John Nance Garner of Texas and how he offered Garner the vice presidency in exchange for the votes from his home state. And how Garner took him up on it. <clears throat> President, he looked at me and he said, he got what he wanted. I got what I wanted. You might have done the same. And I looked at the president, the man that I had cast my lot with so many years before when so many things seemed possible. I looked at the president and I said, well, Mr. President, I could have made a deal too, but I did not care to. And that's what it all finally comes down to. That's who Henry A. Wallace is, finally and forever. A man who would not barter away his principles, no matter the price. Corn, chickens, tomatoes, <laughs> strawberries. I'll have much to occupy me in these coming days, these final days. Of course, I will fight for my life to my final breath. I am a Wallace after all. Well, I guess it was time I was going in. I've had a good day's gardening. I'm sorry, what? What have I, what have I learned from this interesting life of mine? <laughs> well, I've, I've never learned that before, heard that before, but, uh, but I, I, I guess this to be true. The land does not disappoint. God does not disappoint. And it is in our dreams that we will live forever. Good day. <laughs>